Today we will continue examining ideas from Part 9 of Mencius Moldbug's Letter to Open-Minded Progressives, which was published on June 12, 2008. This time we will dive deeper into the operations of the cathedral. Moldbug quotes an interview between Dr. James Watson and Henry Louis Gates, in which Watson prods Gates with the idea of genetic differences in IQ. Gates, uncomfortable with this idea, proclaims that we do not know whether or not there is genetic variance in intelligence across groups of humans. Quoting the interview, quote, James Watson, It was, we shouldn't expect, that people in different parts of the world have equal intelligence, because we all know that, and people say that these should be the same. I think the answer is, we don't know. Gates, we don't know, not that they are. Watson, no, no, I'm always trying to say is that some people of left-wing persuasion have said that there wasn't enough time for differences. We don't know, that's all. Gates, we don't know. End quote. Earlier in the interview, Professor Gates poses a question. Quote, but imagine if you were an African or African-American intellectual, and it's ten years from now, and you pick up the New York Times, hits table, and some geneticist says... A, that intelligence is genetic, and B, the difference is measured on standardized tests between black people and white people is traceable to a genetic basis. What would you, as a black intellectual, do, do you think? End quote. Moldbug shows us the problem with the idea that we don't know whether or not there is genetic variance across groups of humans. Quote, here is the problem. The message our beloved cathedral has been implanting in all the young smart kids at Harvard and Yale and Stanford, the cream of the crop, the top 1%, not to mention the readers of the New York Times who are the top 10%, is not, we don't know. Oh no, the message is, we do know, and they are equal. In fact, we are so sure they're equal that if you even start to hint that you might disagree, we will do everything we can to destroy your life, and we will feel good about it because your opinions are evil, and you are too." End quote. So it's not even a question of ten years from now. White-coated scientists, exercising their papal infallibility through the ordinary magisterium of Times Square, do not need to declare their final and inexorable proof of A and B, thus proving that the cathedral has been broadcasting mendacity since 1924, and enforcing it since 1984. We need await nothing. Any intelligent person can already read the contradiction. Professor Gates has said it out loud. If you accept Dr. Watson's fallback position, his intellectual Torres Vedras, as Professor Gates does, the cathedral is already a goner. Its defeat is not a matter for further research. It is a matter of freshman philosophy. The cathedral has chosen to fortify, not as a minor outpost, but as its central keep, the position of not A and not B. Actually, since not A or not B would suffice, the typical insistence on both is a classic sign of a weak position. Its belief in the statistical uniformity of the human brain across all subpopulations presently living is absolute. It has put all its chips on this one." End quote. The cathedral, like any good religious institution, insists absolutely on the truth of its most foundational doctrine, in this case the existence of a universal human equivalence. To do otherwise would be to instantly self-destruct. It would be like the Catholic Church not affirming the existence of God. Therefore, the cathedral must not deny human equality. At most, its priesthood can appeal to scientific uncertainty in science, a bottomless wellspring for truth avoidance. However, people outside the cathedral do question its truth claims, just like they question those of the Catholic Church. And as bad a position as the Catholic Church seems to be in, amidst modernity, the cathedral is actually cornered into an even worse trap of its own devisement. Moldbug explains the problem with the cathedral's claims. Quote, and the evidence for its position is really not much stronger than the evidence for the Holy Trinity. In fact, the Holy Trinity has a big advantage. There may be no evidence for it, but at least there is none against it. There is plenty of evidence against human neurological uniformity. The question is simply what standard of proof you apply. By the standards that most of us apply to most questions of fact, the answer is already obvious, and has been for at least 30 years, if not 100." End quote. By the standards people are normally willing to accept, human neurological uniformity has been utterly debunked. The scientific method is used to falsify hypotheses, and this premise is about as dead as the idea of a proletariat revolution. Yet people still believe it. How? Quote, Moreover, there is a simple explanation for the reason that so many people believe in human neurological uniformity, HNU. It is a core doctrine of Christianity. 
Even more precisely, it is a core doctrine of the neo-primitive Christianity that we call Protestantism, and specifically, I believe it to be a mutated and metastasized version of the Quaker doctrine of the inner light. Basically, all humans must be neurologically uniform because we all have the same little piece of God inside us. All the American Protestant sects, or at least all the northern ones, became heavily Quakerized during the 19th century. But that's a different discussion. End quote. A simple and clear explanation. Talk to any Christian, and they will tell you that every human has the same spark of divinity within them, and that we are all equal before God. America is a Christian nation. It is not difficult to see how Christian metaphysics is seated deeply into the minds of every American, even the non-believers. And this disbelief in God is acceptable, even popular. But disbelief in the more insidiously acculturated Christian memes is not. Quote, Thus, what we call hate speech is merely a 20th century name for the age-old crime of blasphemy. You might have noticed that it is not and has never been illegal to be an asshole. No government in history has ever come close to criminalizing rudeness, nastiness, meanness, or even harassment in general, not even in the workplace. Denying the inner light, however, is another matter entirely. It is all too easy to put in the fundamental ends, transport ourselves to Margaret Atwood world, and imagine the commander processing an assembly line of blasphemers with this handy neo-Quaker catchphrase, Scorned the testimony of equality, violated right ordering, denied the inner light. Defendant, I think the case is clear. Five years of orientation. So it is almost impossible for me to answer Professor Gates' question. Asking what a black intellectual should do after A and B are demonstrated is like asking what a professor of Marxist-Leninist studies should do after the fall of the Soviet Union. I don't know, dude. What else are you good at? Professor Gates' entire department consists of the construction of increasingly elaborate persecution theories to explain facts which follow trivially from A and B, agree on A and B, and the world has no need at all for Professor Gates, nor any of his colleagues. He seems like a pretty sharp guy. Surely he can find something. If not, there's always pizza delivery. The trouble is that, as we've just seen, A and B need not be shown to demonstrate the presence of official mendacity. It is sufficient to demonstrate that A and B are plausible. More strongly, it is sufficient to demonstrate that they are not implausible. Because we are constantly being educated to believe that they are implausible. The proposition is implied a thousand times for every time it is stated, but progressivism without HNU makes about as much sense as Islam without Allah. End quote. Before we finish this part, let's refresh ourselves on A and B. A is that intelligence is genetic, and B is that intelligence difference is measured on standardized tests. The cathedral tells us that intelligence is not genetic, that people are a tabula rasa, and that anyone can become anything. It tells us that human beings cannot have differences in their intelligences measured via tests. Or perhaps it told us that at the time of Moldbug's writing. Today, more than ten years later, anyone who seriously researches human intelligence will discover that most scientists regard genetic differences as being responsible for about half of intelligence differences between humans. But the cathedral, with its incredible power, doesn't let this knowledge flow freely. One has to ask the question in the first place in order to find the answer, and the cathedral teaches us that even considering the possibility that humans are not neurologically uniform is blasphemy. So the cathedral remains steadfast, as Moldbug continues to explain. Quote, so if refuting a proposition on which the cathedral has staked its credibility is sufficient to defeat it, and that refutation is agreed on by all serious thinkers, why the heck is it still there? Duh, if institutional mendacity is its stock in trade, why on earth should refutation bother it? You don't have to look far for other cases in which entire departments of the cathedral have been devoted to the propagation of nonsense. What do you expect them to do? Say, we're sorry, it's true, we're all a bunch of shills, we'll go work as taxi drivers now? If the cathedral can lie now, it can lie then. It doesn't matter what Dr. Watson and his students produce, now or ten years from now. It is impossible for the New York Times to produce a story saying that A and B are proven. No such story will appear. Rather, the standard of proof will simply be raised and raised again, as of course it has been already. In other words, if the cathedral was a trustworthy mechanism for producing and distributing information, we would expect it to correct any newly discovered error and propagate the connection. 
But if it was a trustworthy mechanism, it would not already be in an obvious error state, have maintained that error state for decades, and show no sign at all of nudging Professor Gates out of the building and into his new career as a marketing executive. Therefore, to expect it to correct its own errors is naive, at best. And therefore, you and I have two choices. We can accept that we live in a state of systemic mendacity, as people always have, note that it may well be getting worse rather than better, and figure out how to live with it. That would be the prudent choice. It demonstrates genuine wisdom, the wisdom of resignation and healthy personal motivation. On the other hand, if you have enough time to read these essays, you have enough time to think about solutions. After all, you already live under a government which demands that you invest a substantial percentage of your neural tissue in the meaningless gabble of politics. This lobe should probably be devoted to dance, literature, or shopping. But we are, after all, human. In addition to our healthier and more positive cogitations, we sometimes express resentment. And what more pleasant repost than to reprogram one's political control module and turn it against its former botmasters? End quote. Unsurprisingly, as Moldbug predicted, ten years later, the standard of proof is indeed raised and raised. It doesn't matter how many times you point out genetic differences in humans. It doesn't matter how much research and funding is poured into the matter. The Cathedral cannot acknowledge even the possibility of genetic differences, officially, or it signs its own death warrant. Trying to convince the cathedral to do so is naive. Trying to convince individual persons is not. Next time, we will cap off part 9 of the open letter with its most important point. Thanks for watching.